Hello to my friends joining us via recording. This is our last review session before the lab final exam. A uh, friendly reminder for us that exam is open now and it is due tomorrow night, Tuesday night by 11.59. So make sure you are planning a time to get that done. I talked with my friends here in class today. We are most interested in looking at the reflex arc model to help us understand the way that we can classify neurons. We are interested in practicing identifying muscles on the muscle man. We are also very interested in looking at that meninges model. So we're gonna start with these things and we're gonna go from there. When we talk about reflexes in lab, this is the model that shows us the components of a reflex arc. Reflexes and kind of the way they work is something that we're gonna focus on more in lecture. That's actually kind of part of the, the lecture chapter we're working on right now. Uh, but when we talk about reflexes in lab, uh, so some big picture ideas that we should know up front. Anytime we say reflex, we should be thinking automatic, meaning you don't have to process this. Um, it's not something that your brain thinks about and tells you what to do. All that we need for a reflex to happen is contained inside itself. So what I mean by that is from the moment that you detect something, for example, in your skin, to the moment where you do a movement, so for example, moving your hand away, all of that is contained in a reflex arc. So we're gonna label our parts of a reflex arc here and use that to help us classify neurons. When we talk about a reflex arc, the first part of it, and we can see it here highlighted in green, and also kind of these little branches that I see up here, the first part of any reflex arc is the receptors. The receptors, let me move this closer. And the receptors are these little nerve endings that we see here, or in particular, you can see the little green places where maybe there's some extra connected tissue on it. All of this part of, of my reflex arc, this is where I actually detect stimuli. So the receptors are things that are gonna change their shape or they're gonna change their chemistry, uh, their temperature changes in response to a stimulus, whatever it is that's making a reflex happen. So let's say we're, we're doing a reflex related to heat. The receptors are the parts down here that actually detect changes in temperature. Those changes in temperature are detected by the receptor part of a neuron, and then that information is sent back to the spinal cord in this yellow neuron here. The yellow neuron here is called a sensory neuron, a sensory neuron. The job of a sensory neuron is to take the information that the receptors collect and send that information back to the spinal cord where it can be processed. So sensory neurons don't process information at all, they just transport it from wherever it's detected to the spinal cord where it's going to end up. In the spinal cord, or in lecture, we'll talk about how it could be in the brain stem, we send that information to what's called an interneuron, an interneuron. This interneuron that we see right here, its job is to do something uh, that we call integration. Integration. That is processing. That's taking that sensory information, figuring out what it means, um, figuring out that, oh, that temperature is really hot. I shouldn't leave my hand on, on a hot burner. That's the kind of thing that an interneuron does. It interprets the information that came from the sensory neuron. When the interneuron knows what you should be doing based on that sensory information, it's going to send those directions out of the spinal cord using a motor neuron. So this orange neuron we see here is a motor neuron. Motor neurons send directions or motor neurons make things happen. In particular, motor neurons are going to go down to what we call the effector of a reflex arc. The effector is the thing that actually has an effect. So when you touch a hot burner, the effector would be those muscles that make you pull your hand away from the burner. 
Uh, if we're talking about stepping on something in, in lecture, we talk about the stepping on a Lego reflex. Uh, when we're talking about that, the effector would be the muscles that help you to lift your foot off that Lego. So in a reflex arc, the five parts that we need to know, the receptors that collect information, the sensory neurons that send that information back to the central nervous system, the interneuron, which is the processing neuron that figures out what to do, the motor neuron that sends those directions out to the effector that makes things happen. On this image, we have already labeled the functional classifications of neurons in the body. So when I talk about the functional classification of a neuron, I'm asking you what it does, what it does. So a sensory neuron, that's a neuron that collects information. An interneuron is a neuron that processes information. And a motor neuron is a neuron that sends directions, that says what should be happening. That's all my functional classifications of neurons. There is another way, though, that you can classify, classify your neurons. And that other way of classifying neurons is called their structural classification. Structural classification. And this is going to be based on its shape. Help me out in, in the chat if we can remember this. When we talk about the structural classification of neurons, there's three different structural classifications that, that we talked about. Okay, so tyranny has, has one of them. One of them is called unipolar. So it's those polar words, unipolar. What other structural classifications have we talked about? Unipolar, yep, we talked about multipolar. Yep, and that last one is bipolar, bipolar. These are the three possibilities when I ask you for the structural classification of a neuron. So when we look at our, our neurons that we've classified functionally, we can also classify them based on their shape. Uh, so so Tierney is absolutely right. She's gone through and helped us out with these. This sensory neuron that we see right here, notice here are all of its dendrites where it receives information and then it funnels that information into one long dendrite or one long part that connects with its axon that takes information away. Notice that the cell body of this neuron is out here and there's just one extension that comes down from that cell body. If I just have one extension off the cell body, I call that a unipolar neuron, unipolar, one extension that's coming off of it. <clears throat> hey, this particular area right here is something that I told you you should always be looking for when you look at a spinal cord model. Does anyone happen to remember what this big bump back here is called? It does have a big, long name, so I'll, I'll give you a moment. Let me circle it. Talking about this thing right here. Yeah, several of us are, are getting it for me. That big thing back there is called the dorsal root ganglion. The dorsal root ganglion. This part here in the back is the dorsal root of a spinal nerve. It's the part of a spinal nerve. So here's a spinal nerve right here where there's sensory and motor neurons together. Some of that splits and attaches to the dorsal side or the back side of the spinal cord. Here's that dorsal root. Here's the ventral root in the front. Remember that the dorsal root has a big bump on it. The reason it has that bump is it's where the cell bodies of all of these unipolar neurons are found. So the reason there's a dorsal root ganglion is because that's where my sensory neuron cell bodies are hanging out. They're right here in that dorsal root. They've got this bump, this ganglion, where they live. 
So this is a unipolar neuron. When we talk about unipolar neurons, here Dr. Aulis is going to do a sketch. A unipolar neuron in its simplest form is going to look kind of like that. We're looking at the cell body. It has one extension coming off of it, unipolar. The next structural classification that we see on our reflex arc model are what we call multipolar neurons, multipolar neurons. So our multipolar neurons are what we find are, are both the interneuron and the motor neuron, multipolar. Oops, here we go. Multipolar neurons, both this interneuron here and this motor neuron right here. The way that we know these are multipolar neurons is because I look at their cell body and see multiple extensions coming off of them, multiple places where things are attached. So when we look at a typical multipolar neuron, this is the one way back in the day when we first started drawing neurons in unit number three. That's the one that I liked to draw for you. Here's a typical multipolar neuron. Got a cell body with lots of dendrites attached to it, and then one long axon that comes out. Because there are multiple extensions coming off of the cell body, we call it multipolar. The type of neuron, the structural classification of neuron that I don't see on this model is the bipolar neuron. When we talk about a bipolar neuron, how many extensions come off of a bipolar neuron? What does that bi part mean? Yeah, bipolar means two, right? So a bipolar neuron would look something like this. Here's my cell body, all of my dendrites, connect to one part of the cell body and all of the information I pass along comes out the other side. Notice how I've got a cell body that has one area that receives information and one area that sends information. When we talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, bipolar neurons, really the only place we find these are in places where we do the special senses. So yeah, Tyranny's right. When you look at that retina model uh, that, that you needed to know from the last lab packet, there are bipolar neurons there. So bipolar neurons help with the process of vision. They help with the process of smelling, absolutely. Um, they help with the process of equilibrium or balancing. Um, <clears throat> so bipolar neurons very much involved in special senses, but the only place you're going to see them in lab is going to be on that retina model, a bipolar neuron. Here is my wink, wink, nudge, nudge for your studying. Make sure you read your question slowly. If the question is asking you for a functional classification, Please do not tell me the functional classification of a neuron is that it's multipolar. That's not functional classification. That's structural classification. If it asks you for the structural classification, please don't tell me that it's a sensory neuron. Make sure to read your questions slowly. When you read them slowly, you'll get your tip off. Are we looking for how something works or are we looking for its shape? So just take your time with it, read the question slowly, and use these little ugly sketches or whatever those neurons look like in your mind. Use that to help you with the types of classifications. Before we move on, any questions about these things? I got a thumbs up. I'm gonna put in my little cricket. Uh, which drawing is bipolar? Um, this one right here would be a bipolar neuron, right here. It has one extension on the left and one extension on the right. So this is a bipolar neuron. This one is a multipolar neuron. So imagine a little arrow going over here. 
yeah, they were they weren't lined up the best. <laughs> okay, so that's the extent of what you need to know about um, reflex arcs. That is also the extent of structural functional classification stuff that we need to know. Um, so if I'm interpreting your question correctly, Gloria, um, you're asking about what words fit as functional classifications. So the functional classification words are sensory, interneuron, or motor neuron. Receptors is, is a separate thing. This is part of a reflex arc. Uh, because we originally started with this model by labeling the parts of a reflex arc. So technically receptors are just part of a sensory neuron. The functional classification of this neuron we would say is a sensory neuron. That's that's its function. Just like we've got our motor neuron, its function is, is being a motor neuron or an interneuron. Yeah. So we labeled more than one thing on our, our picture here. All right, let's go to the next thing that we agreed we wanted to talk about, and that was muscles. I am not going to label every single muscle in the body. I don't think that's the best use of our time together. What I want you all to help me do is tell me in the chat, what are some muscles that you're having trouble finding or you can use the little pencil up here. If you want to draw a line on a muscle that you want us to, to figure out as a class, we can do it that way too. But I probably won't go through and label everybody. If there are certain muscles either you can't find based on their name, give me their name, or if you can draw a line for me on any muscles we can't identify, that would be helpful for me to know where we need to focus. Okay, Tyranny has a question about the oblique muscles. On muscle man, we can only see one set of oblique muscles. On muscle man, do we see the external or the internal obliques? Which do we see on muscle man? Any ideas? Yeah, when we're looking at muscle man, here's a little line to him right there. We see the external obliques the external obliques the only place we can see the internal obliques is if you refer back to your packet um, there's a different model that focuses just on the abdominal cavity you can see them on that model we cannot see them on muscle man so on muscle man we're just seeing those ones here on the outside that are the external obliques we also, when we're talking about abdominal muscles here, we can also only see one other abdominal muscle on Muscle Man. What's the name of the six pack muscle? This one here in the very middle of the abdomen. What's the name of this one here? Yeah, so this one here, it runs parallel to uh, the abdominal cavity or parallel to the vertebral column back behind it. That's what this word rectus means, is parallel. So here's rectus abdominis. Here's those external obliques. When I go to the back side of muscle man, back here, this muscle right here is not an oblique muscle. What's the name of this big muscle in the back part of, of the back here? This one right here. Yeah, so, so Gloria's right. The one that we see down below is called latissimus dorsi. Sometimes, Jim, people call it the lats, latissimus dorsi. Latissimus dorsi goes all the way from your lumbar spine. It actually connects up on your humerus. So there's, there's a gym workout called the lat pull down where you reach something above your head and pull it down. That's actually working these muscles way in your lower back, latissimus dorsi. Up above latissimus dorsi is this diamond shaped muscle up higher. What's the big diamond shaped muscle here in, in the back? 
the big one up higher. Yeah, that big one up higher is trapezius. Trapezius. So the two biggest muscles in the back, trapezius up high, latissimus dorsi down below it. We've got some really big ones here in the shoulders, one on each side. What's that muscle in, in the top of the shoulders up there? Yeah, that big one up there is the deltoid. Draw a little line down to it. We have a deltoid on the shoulder of, of both of our arms, obviously. So deltoid on both sides up here. When I look on, on muscle man kind of below the deltoid, there are two muscles that we need to know. We need to know this little one right here and this bigger one over here. Let me put numbers here. So my bigger one is going to be number one. My smaller one is going to be number two. Do we have any idea? Let's start with number two. Do we have any idea on number two what this one is? Oh, my chat's lighting up with number one as Terry's major. We might need to rethink that one. Let me pull up and I'll show you my screen when I get it here. Let's see if I can find a good picture to share with you. That's pretty good. Ah, yeah, some of us are. Well, okay, I'm gonna lose. If I if I go away, I'm gonna lose my markings, so I won't go away. Uh, I'll show it to you when we finish labeling. Um, we are starting to hone in on it on the chat. Number two right here is actually Terry's major. Number two is Terry's major. This big one right here, number one, is infraspinatus. Yeah, so uh, I'll show you a picture when we finish on this slide. I will show you the, the color-coded picture I found here. So number one is infraspinatus. Number two is Terry's major so if we we wanted to look at it that this big one its name infra spinatus means that it's inferior to the spine of the scapula infra spinatus is the big muscle that's underneath this right here if you're thinking about bone markings this right here is the spine of the scapula so the muscle that's right underneath it first we see the deltoid that attaches to it but then right underneath it, we see the infraspinatus that's also below the spine. Teres sticks out into the, the arm a little bit farther on the outside. So if we were looking on the other side of the arm, we'd see infraspinatus up here and little tiny teres major down below. If I'm going to flag teres major, though, I'm going to flag it right here because you can see it really well. Teres major here and this big one infraspinatus next to it. So back muscles. Big trapezius, big latissimus dorsi. Next to latissimus dorsi is the teres major and the infraspinatus that I see right here, right below the spine of the scapula. What muscle lives on the back side of the arm? What's this big one that I see on both arms on the back? Who's on the back side of the arm? Yeah, the back side of the arm is where I find triceps brachii. Triceps brachii. We talked about this morning how triceps means there are three attachment sites. So there are three places where this triceps muscle attaches. On the opposite side of the arm, so we'll go over to the front side here, on the opposite side of the arm right here and also right here, we see a muscle that has two attachment sites. What's the one on the front side of your arm? Front side. Yeah, the front side one is biceps brachii. Biceps brachii. So biceps on the front, triceps on the back. <clears throat> we can go down into the leg down here. So this big muscle that I can see in red, I hope we all know this one right here. What's the name of your bottom muscle, shall we say? The big one there. 
Yep, the, the big one here is gluteus maximus. Gluteus maximus. Maximus means biggest. Important for us to know that there's gluteus maximus and then also see that light pink that I drew a line to there? That is another gluteus muscle. That one is gluteus medius. Gluteus medius, the middle-sized gluteal muscle. So gluteus medius is going to be lighter in color. It's, it's covered in connective tissue. That's why it looks a little bit lighter. Gluteus medius uh, is the lighter colored one that I see. Gluteus maximus is what's, what's actually in the gluteal region toward the backside, the big one. Then we get down. Um, help me out in the chat. Did we learn the muscle tensor fascia latte? I know I talked about it, but I don't know if we actually, okay, we did actually learn it. Okay, um, so tensor fascia latte is this little muscle that I see right here. So uh, tensor fascia latte, let's draw a little line over here. Big long name. That's this muscle that I see connected to. So through the connective tissue, I see it connected to gluteus maximus. Um, the question, can we see it in the anterior view? Uh, not super well. Uh, we can probably see it in the lateral view best, and I don't know if I have any good lateral view pictures to show you. Um, but if you know that it's at the bottom of this connective tissue that the gluteus maximus is attached to, the tensor fascia latte, that, that should help you with finding it. So that's this one here. Next to tensor fascia latte, we have the, the muscle that's on the lateral side of the thigh. What's the name of the muscle that's on the lateral side of the thigh? Who's this one out here on the outside? Yeah, Tierney's right. The one on the outside is called biceps femoris. Biceps femoris. Biceps femoris, please never tell me that biceps femoris is up here in the arm. Please never tell me that biceps brachii is down here in the legs. Make sure we get those regional terms right, femoris versus brachii. Next to biceps femoris, the muscle that we're learning on the inside, the medial side of the thigh in the back, this one has a kind of long name. I'll, I'll help us out here with it. Yes, a couple of us are, are typing it. Actually, I gotta move that down so you can read it. <laughs> the, the muscle in the middle next to biceps on the backside next to biceps is called semitendinosus. So semitendinosus and biceps femoris. Semitendinosus and biceps femoris. As a heads up, we didn't make you identify this one, but we did make you know its action. Right next door, this little tiny muscle that's right next to semitendinosus is something called semimembranosus. So semimembranosus is back here as well. You don't need to be able to identify it, but if I ask you what its action is, its action is the same thing as biceps femoris, and it's the same thing as semitendinosus because it lives on the back side next to these things. So as a heads up, semimembranosus is a little tiny muscle that's hiding inside here. We don't make you know that one. You make you identify that one because it's so, so tricky to see that one. All right, let's go down into the leg itself down here. The big muscle, the calf muscle down here, what's the name of the calf muscle? The calf muscle on the back side. A weird one to spell. Yeah, so, so the muscle that we show off when we wear heels, that's called the gastrocnemius. The gastrocnemius. That's the muscle here in the back. Next to the gastrocnemius on the outside, or maybe you can see it a little bit better um, on this side over here, 
is the muscle that's on top of the fibula. So the muscle on top of the fibula, technically it has two names. The one that, that its location helps us out with is fibularis longus. But when you do a Google search, you might see this one called peroneus. So on the outside, fibularis longus, on the very back, peroneus, tucked in between them, this muscle that I see right here is called soleus, soleus. So we'll put that little name in there too. So from front to back on this leg here, we have fibularis longus on the fibula side. Then we have the soleus in between, and we have the gastrocnemius on the very back. On this side, we can see the gastrocnemius, then the soleus, and then fibularis longus on the outside. Those are the three that we can see from the outside. When we go to the front, we see this one right here, What's the special one that we see on the front of the tibia? The front of the tibia. Its name actually tells us exactly that same thing. Yep. So the name of this muscle on the front, tibialis anterior. Tibialis anterior. It's on the front side of the tibia. So here's tibialis anterior on the front. We can see it over here as well. That would be another tibialis anterior. We can see some of those muscles we labeled before. So the one in the very back, I'm not going to type its whole name, but there's the gastrocnemius in the very back. And we can see just in front of it, that muscle called the soleus. So tibialis anterior, the one muscle that we cannot see on the back side of the body, obviously, because it's on the front side of the body. When we look at the front side of the thigh, we've got a completely different set of muscles compared to what we saw on the back side of the thigh. So let's start with this big one right here that runs parallel to your femur. The big muscle parallel to your femur. Any ideas what we'd call this one here? Yeah, so parallel to your femur. Remember, rectus means parallel. Femoris means the femur. Rectus femoris, that's this muscle here in the very middle of your thigh. Next to it, we have two very large muscles, meaning vastus, or vastus is, is what, uh, very large is, is what that word means in its name. Vastus, the one on the middle side, what would it be vastus what, if we're on the middle side? Yeah, vastus medialis on the middle side. And my one on the outside, is vastus lateralis, vastus lateralis. So the two biggest, the two vastus muscles on either side of rectus femoris. Toward the top of rectus femoris, you can see this muscle right here that runs from the hip bone all the way down and attaches on the tibia. You can see it over here as well. So see this long muscle right here. This is actually the longest muscle in the body What's the name of this one that goes at an angle right here across the, the front side of the thigh? Running out of space. <laughs> yeah, that, that big long one that goes from inside to outside, sartorius. Sartorius, this one that runs right here. The last one to mention on, on this leg is this muscle right here. It's also this muscle that I see on the other side this is a muscle that's named based on what it does. Does anyone know what we call these, these muscles here? It's a, it's a group of muscles. 
Yeah, Jesse's right. The muscles in the middle of the thigh, these ones here are called the adductor muscles, this triangle, the adductor group. So the last one I can see on this leg is the adductor group. Somebody in the chat had asked me about fibularis um, on, on the anterior view of the leg. I believe this little guy right here is fibularis longus, also known as peroneus, because we're kind of seeing the leg from the side. So fibularis longus or peroneus, this one right here. So tibialis and then fibularis next door to it. All right, so we already named a lot of these muscles here. Let me draw some tags for what we've labeled. We have labeled the big one in the middle, so I'm just going to give part of its name. Rectus is that big one in the middle. We just talked about the longest one in the body. That's sartorius, so our, our big long one right here. Hey, this is the large muscle that's on the middle side again. Who would I call the large muscle in the middle? Large muscle in the middle. Yeah, vastus medialis. There's vastus medialis. That's all the ones that we have labeled already. There's one other one that we hadn't labeled yet, and it's this long skinny one that I just circled inside here. So the long skinny one right there, who's that? Do we know that one? It runs straight up and down on the inner thigh. Uh, Semitendinosis is more on the back side. There's actually one that, that we haven't talked a lot about. Yeah, Miriam's right. It's, it's a new one for us. It's called gracilis. Gracilis. The only view I can see gracilis in is, is this one right here. It runs along the medial thigh. The gracilis muscle, it would be tucked next to semitendinosis. So if we could see in between the, the inside of the leg, see it a little bit better, we would see the gracilis muscle running all the way along the middle as well. So um, that's, a, that's a middle muscle that's next to the adductors. And then next door to it is semitendinosis, like we already talked about. And then semimembranosis, chilling inside here, and biceps femoris toward the outside. Don't beat yourself up, Gloria. There's lots of muscles in the leg that you're learning. If you totally knew that, it's better to miss it in our session now than to miss it on the test, right? So 100%, you're totally going to get that. If you get that on your exam, that's gracilis. Now we know that, right? <laughs> All right, let's see. Yeah, so there's a couple that we have not labeled yet. One of them that Monica asked us about is a muscle called sternocleidomastoid. Let's add that one, big long name there, sternocleidomastoid. We talked about in the session this morning how its big long name tells us everywhere it attaches, the sternum, the clavicle, and the mastoid process, which is a bone marking here on the temporal bone. So here is that sternocleidomastoid muscle in the neck. Yeah, Tierney asked about and then found again the gracilis muscle along the, the medial thigh, this line here. Um, surely we all know this one. What's the name of the one in your chest? Let's draw a line for it. The big one in our chest. Yeah, the, the big one in the chest is pectoralis major. When someone talks about their pecs, pectoralis major, the big ones here on the outside of the chest. When we ask you to label muscles of the, the face or on the skull, we'll probably use that big skull. But there are a couple that I think we could identify. I probably won't type them because I don't have a lot of space, but... Uh, this is the one here that's in your forehead. Do we remember the name of the muscle in your forehead? Its name actually comes from the bone that is in your forehead. Yep, so, so this little muscle that we can kind of see here is the frontalis muscle. 
here's the muscle that lives by your ears on top of the temporal bone. Yep, there would be temporalis. Here's the one that helps you to chew, the one on the side of your face. Yeah, that one over here that helps us to chew is called the masseter. I'll type that for our friends joining us via recording. This one right here is the masseter muscle. And I've got, we can only kind of see it, but I've got a muscle that circles around the eye. It makes a circle around the eye. Anybody remember that circle muscle? Yeah, so circle, the way we do circle is orbicularis. And since we're around the eye, absolutely, we call this orbicularis oculi. Absolutely, orbicularis oculi. So again, you can see them better on our, our big muscle man, or if I'm using little muscle man to ask you those things, I will make it an up close picture like you have in the lab packet. So um, just make sure we can identify those muscles. So Lauren asked for the one, we can kind of see it, that makes a circle around the mouth. Can we, can we help her out? Yeah, Gloria's right. The one that makes a circle around the mouth, still orbicularis, but now it's oris for the oral region. So the circle around the mouth, orbicularis oris, absolutely. Okay, so I think all we have left is the arm, right? This region down here. Before I move away from this picture and we lose all of our hard work labeling, any last minute questions before I move to a zoomed in picture for the arms? Or send me an emoji. If you're tracking with me, send me an emoji. Or send me a question if we're, we still got a question. Okay, got some thumbs up. So here, let's go to our zoomed in pictures. We are focusing right here. Now, I wanna mention something for you when you're thinking about Muscle Man. I know you haven't seen him in 3D, but when we're looking at Muscle Man, this is the palm of his hand. So if we're thinking about anatomical position, which is the position that you need to use when you're thinking about predicting muscle actions. In anatomical position, the palm of your hand is facing forward, or it's on the anterior side of your body. So when we start labeling the muscles in here, keep in mind that we're talking about the anterior muscles on your arm. I'm looking up at the anterior side of the arm. I mention that because here's a quick wink, wink, nudge, nudge for you. The anterior side of your arm, the, the palm side of your arm, is the place where we find the flexors. You should never tell me that a flexor muscle is found on the back side of the arm. I promise 100% of the time. Flexor muscles are found on the front side of the arm. Extensor muscles are found on the back side of the arm. So if we're labeling something that's on the palm side of muscle man, our, our only options are either the big long muscle that goes down into the palm. What's the name of this one, this big one that goes down into the palm of the hand? Who goes down into the palm of the hand? Yeah, exactly. The one that you can see going all the way to the palm of the hand, palmaris longus, palmaris longus. On either side of palmaris longus, we have our two flexor muscles, the two flexor muscles. This is the flexor muscle that's on the same side as the pinky. This is the flexor muscle that's on the same side as the thumb. Which side of the arm is going to have flexor, carpi, radialis? Pinky side or thumb side? 
Who's got radialis? Yeah, radialis is by the radius, which is on the thumb side. So this muscle that lives next door to palmaris longus with its big, long tendon that goes down into the palm, this one right here is flexor carpi radialis. Let me type its big, long name. Flexor carpi radialis. I know it's a flexor because we're on the anterior side of the body, or like Gloria mentioned, we're on the palm side of the arm. When I'm on the palm side or when I'm on the anterior side, that's where my flexors are found. So when I see palmaris longus, every time you look at the arm, first the forearm, the first thing you look for is can I see palmaris longus? If I can see palmaris longus, that tells me I'm on the anterior side. We are always referencing or referring to palmaris longus in the middle. Because then on the thumb side, we've got flexor carpi radialis. And on the other side, we've got flexor carpi ulnaris. Flexor carpi ulnaris on the pinky side. So when I am looking at this view, always start by finding palmaris longus. If I see this big, long, white tendon into the palm of the hand, that's palmaris longus. On the pinky side, we've got flexor carpi ulnaris. On the thumb side, flexor carpi radialis. Two other muscles that we're labeling then, we've got our muscle on the front side of the arm. Who lives here on the front? What's this one right here? Yeah, this one right here is biceps brachii. Biceps brachii. And the one on the back side of the arm then, who lives on the back side of the arm? Yep, triceps brachii. So triceps brachii on the back side, biceps brachii on the front, palmaris longus goes down into the palm, and then we look on either side of palmaris longus to find those flexors. And remember, 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 when we're looking at the palm side of the hand, it's those flexors. We've got the flexors on the palm side. When we go to the back side of the hand, now we're talking about extensors. Now we switch to the part that does extension. The way you'll know you're looking at the back side of the hand or when we're doing our, our reference points, our extensors um, start with one big one that goes all the way down into the fingers. What's the name of the big one in the middle of the back of the forearm? The one that goes down into the fingers on the forearm. Yeah, exactly. Extensor digitorum. Extensor digitorum, digitorum meaning fingers. So we're going to reference to extensor digitorum. That's the one that goes into the digits of the finger. That's the first thing we want to find. When we find extensor digitorum, then on the thumb side of extensor digitorum, draw my line here, on the thumb side of extensor digitorum, I'm going to abbreviate. We have extensor carpi. Carpi, we'll do that whole word. Radialis. Technically radialis longus, to be fair, but you don't have to type the name. You'll just select the name. Right next door to extensor digitorum, extensor carpi radialis. We cannot see very well up here a muscle that would be found right next door to extensor digitorum, so we can see it just a little bit here. We can see it better when we come down here. This is my other extensor one. So extensor carpi ulnaris. That's where I'd find it on the other side of extensor digitorum. So I'll label it down on the bottom too. 
extensor carpi ulnaris. Remember, ulnaris means I'm on the ulna side. So extensor carpi radialis is on the radius side of extensor digitorum. Extensor carpi ulnaris on the ulna side. When we come down and we're looking at the arm down here, we can see extensor digitorum right here. I'll label it. But for the record, I'm not never going to ask you to identify it down there. That's extensor digitorum. I know that's extensor digitorum because you can see it going down. See how it goes down into the digits, into the fingers. Here's extensor digitorum. So next door to extensor digitorum, extensor carpi ulnaris going down into the wrist. Extensor digitorum, extensor carpi ulnaris. Um, the other big one for us to know in the forearm is the thing called brachioradialis. Brachioradialis. Brachioradialis means we start in the arm. So we start on the humerus. We go down to the radius. Brachio radialis. We can see that one up here. And you can actually see it down here as well. Starting in the arm, going down toward the radius. Brachio radialis. So I'll label it, but again, I'm most likely to, to ask you about it up here. Brachio radialis. I'm looking at my list here. The other ones. I, I bet you you can find um, everybody select or some of us select use your pencil up here show me where we see the deltoid muscle draw me a line or a circle or a dot yep there's that deltoid shoulder right so big shoulder muscle deltoid muscle when we're on the back side my favorite question who's here on the back side so underneath the deltoid here on the back Who's this one? Draw the line. Yeah, the one here in the back. That's the triceps, as usual, because it's on the back side. Triceps, brachii, and then there on the front side is the biceps, brachii. What, if any, questions remain about muscle man? Are there any particular muscles we're still concerned about? Everyone's least favorite thing for Dr. Aulis to say is for any of the muscles that are giving you trouble, it's just going to be practice. It's going to be looking at that muscle over and over and over again, which stinks. I totally get it. There's no fast way to learn it. Although I would recommend if you can get an idea, if you feel on yourself where these muscles are found, so if you go through and, and touch the top of your shoulder and say out loud deltoid, and then you touch the back of your arm and say out loud triceps brachii, touch the front side and say biceps brachii. Um, if you remember from lecture, when we were talking about the ways that you make memories, one of them was by um, repetition but also engaging your senses, making sure you're alert. If you're talking out loud, if you're feeling touch sensations, all of those kinds of things will help you to make memories. So consider since I'm totally not going to sit there and watch your entire exam recording, um, you can feel your body as much as you want to. You can move your body as much as you want to when you're predicting movements. You get to use your body on the exam. That's not cheating. So use your body. Hopefully that'll help you as you're identifying muscles, as you're predicting movements, those kind of things. All right, if there's no last questions about muscles, then the one other thing we had decided as a group to cover was meninges. So let's talk meninges, and then we can decide where we want to go from here. <clears throat> when we talk about 
the meninges, the first thing for us to know is that these are the connective tissue membranes that cover the brain or that form a protective barrier around the brain. There are three meninges in particular, or three layers of connective tissue for us to know. They all have this word mater in their name. So we have the arachnoid mater, the dura mater, and the pia mater. When I'm talking about these mater layers or these meninges, one layer is attached directly to the brain. Which of these three layers is attached directly to the brain? Do we remember? I'll, let's see, I'll label it over here. So my little thin pink layer that's directly attached to the brain is the pia mater, the pia mater, the deepest layer, the thin pink that I see here attached to, to the brain directly, that's called the pia mater. This word pia means delicate or gentle. So I've got this gentle layer touching the brain directly called the pia mater. Just outside the pia mater, we see this layer here in kind of the seafoam green color. This seafoam green color here has all these little collagen fibers that come down, look a lot like spider webs. What is um, the name of this layer of my meninges, this, this middle layer here? Yeah, the middle layer is called the arachnoid mater arachnoid like spiders uh, that's literally how it has its name the arachnoid mater with these these collagen spider webs that come down from it the last layer then this really thick layer on the outside is the dura mater dura mater somebody mentioned in the chat that dura means tough that's absolutely right so the dura mater is this thick tough layer on the outside then right below it we have what's called the arachnoid mater with all its little collagen fibers coming down and on the very outside of the brain the last one is called the pia mater that one touches the brain there are a few extra things that we need to know when we look at at this model and it's the spaces in between the layers or even we might say inside the layers let's start with the space that's in between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater what is the name of this space where i see those little spider webs hanging down yeah so that that spider web space there is called the sub arachnoid space uh, i should have picked a different color sorry the subarachnoid space. So that is all of this, this area here. That's not a helpful box. Bear with me. <laughs> the subarachnoid space is everything in here. Essentially, everything between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. Subarachnoid, underneath the arachnoid mater. So in between where the pia is touching the brain, and where the arachnoid mater has all those spider webs attached, that's called the subarachnoid space. The subarachnoid space is filled with something. What do I find inside the subarachnoid space? What's inside of here between those spider webs? Yeah, Lauren's right. The subarachnoid space is filled with cerebrospinal fluid cerebrospinal fluid or the the easy way to to write it as csf so cerebrospinal fluid fills the subarachnoid space but you're, you're not wrong jesse because that is it is related uh jesse was was mentioning these things called arachnoid granulations arachnoid granulations help me out because this cerebrospinal fluid that's inside the subarachnoid space, I am always making and making and making more and more of it. I need to drain it out of the subarachnoid space. And that's where these little bubbles that I see right here, 
called arachnoid granulations. That's where these things come into play, these bubbles. See, arachnoid granulations, we'll just draw a line to them. Arachnoid granulations, think about them kind of like drains. I make cerebral spinal fluid. It's floating around in the subarachnoid space, <clears throat> but I don't want it all to stay there. Remember, we, we talked about in lecture how if I have too much cerebral spinal fluid, that can lead to hydrocephalus, too much fluid up there. So I have these little escape valves, these little balloons that spit out cerebral spinal fluid. They're called arachnoid granulations or sometimes you'll see them called arachnoid villi. It's the same thing. These bubbles that I see right here, their job is to drain the cerebrospinal fluid that would be here inside the subarachnoid space. So arachnoid granulations drain cerebrospinal fluid, particularly into this space right here. And yeah, and Gloria is completely right. This space here that's empty on my model, but normally when you look at it in real life, it would be filled with blood. So I'm adding some red blood here. This blood filled space up here is the area called the dural venous sinus, the dural venous sinus. It's an open space in between the parts of the dura mater. So all of this beige stuff is the dura mater where it's split in half. The dura mater split. There's a space for blood to drain out from around the brain. It's also the space where I put that extra cerebrospinal fluid when I'm done with it circulating around the brain. So this open space is the dural venous sinus. This little bubble is that arachnoid granulation. We spill stuff from the arachnoid granulation into the dural venous sinus. How do we feel about the meninges now? Thumbs up, thumbs down, crying emoji. <laughs> Hopefully not too many tears. Good. I'm glad Tierney says that, that that was helpful for her. Excellent. Okay, so I have 20 minutes left. Let me go back to our list of potential topics. With the time that we have remaining, I know that we had a couple of votes for the sarcomere model. Uh, I think we had a couple of votes maybe for the brain model. Tell me in the chat, where would we like to go? Or the tissues? What do, what do we want to do here in, in the time that we've got left? Okay, I got a couple of votes for the brain. Um, so let's go to the brain, and then we can see how long that brain takes us. After we do the brain, we can, can see what time we got left. So... Uh, the brain model I'm going to use um, is, is the summary model that has like all the structures on it, because if we can can label stuff on here, we can find pretty much everything that that we're supposed to find. When we talk about the brain, we have part of the brain that's known as the brain stem. So the lowest part of the brain is this group of structures down here called the brain stem. There are three parts to the brainstem. Let's start with the lowest part of the brainstem, the part that's connected to the spinal cord. What is the name of this structure down here that's connected to the spinal cord? What's this lowest structure called down here? Anybody know? Yeah, Tierney's right. This lowest structure in the brainstem is called the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata. When you're studying cranial nerves, this is the location of some of those last cranial nerves. 
So 9, 10, 11, 12, all of them are attached down here on the medulla oblongata. A lot of the cranial nerves though, most of the cranial nerves are attached to this big thing, this big bump right here. What's the name of this big bump? This should be easier to type. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the big bump there is something called the pons, the pons. And up above the pons is a little region, we didn't talk a lot about it, but that little region there, yeah, is a part called the midbrain. When we talked about the midbrain, we, we kind of cared less about the midbrain itself and more about the bumps that we find on the back side of it. Does anyone happen to know, and it's okay if we butcher the spelling, does anyone happen to know what we called these four bumps back here? Yeah, so, so those four bumps, their technical name is the corpora quadrigemina. Corpora quadrigemina. This stupid long, not English name here, quad means four, corpora means bodies. So corpora quadrigemina, four bodies. There's four bumps on the backside of the midbrain. That's this part right here. The corpora quadrigemina are your reflex sensors in the midbrain. So this is visual reflexes, as in you see a ball coming at your face and it makes you want to move your head. That's a visual reflex. Uh, this is things like auditory reflexes. So you hear a door slam and it makes you jump. Those are all the kinds of things that the corpora quadrigemina help you out with. When we took talk about uh, the pons, when we talk about the medulla oblongata, remember that we talked about in lecture how both of these places help us with breathing. Uh, they're going to help us things with things like um, vomiting reflex or heart rate. So um, those are the kinds of things, things that keep you alive are the kinds of things that the pons and the medulla oblongata do. Let's go behind the brain stem to this structure right here. What's the name of this structure right here? Yeah, so this whole thing here is called the cerebellum. We have a special name for the white matter that's inside the cerebellum. Yeah, the white matter inside of the cerebellum is called the arbor vitae, the tree of life. That's the white matter that's here in the middle of the cerebellum. Hey, let's make a connection with our ventricles with our fluid filled spaces in the brain. This opening that I see right here between the cerebellum and the pons, what's this one called right here? Do we know? Yeah, so Jessie's brave and she's guessing for us correctly that that fluid filled space called the fourth ventricle, the fourth ventricle. It's found between the cerebellum and the pons, the fourth ventricle. This is another place, by the way, where there would be cerebrospinal fluid. So where I would have that CSF flowing through. Let's move up into the, the part of the brain called the diencephalon. When we talk about the diencephalon, there are a, a few main parts to it. The first one is what we talked about together as a class as kind of the, the duck face in the middle of the brain. In lecture, we called this the relay center. Yeah, so the, the duck face area, the relay center, is what we call the thalamus. Down below the thalamus, kind of the bill of the duck, below the thalamus, is an area called the hypothalamus. Hypo means below, so the bill of the duck down here. Here's the duck's face, that is the thalamus. And it's little feather that sticks out in the back, that little part that sticks out in the back is the pineal gland 
or uh, you might be labeling it in the packet the epithalamus. Epi means above. So this little thing uh, up above, the epithalamus. Epithalamus, the, the only part we really care about is the pineal gland. So these are kind of interchangeable with each other. On the top of the duck's head, this white thing that I see right here, this is something called the fornix. The fornix. And the fornix is involved uh, in the process of sending memories into your hippocampus. So the fornix is the very top of the duck's head there. So the thalamus is the duck head, the duck bill, is the hypothalamus, then we've got the pineal gland or the epithalamus back here, and the fornix right there. This white line right here, the really big white line, this is a we absolutely must know this structure right here. What's the name of this, this white thing right here that we absolutely must know? I'm like 99.999% confident you will see that. Yeah, a couple of us have, have chimed in with it. This is a must know. Corpus callosum, this, this white thing right here. What's the job of the corpus callosum? What does it do in the brain? Why is it so important? Oh, maybe we don't remember. Yeah, there we go. The corpus callosum is an example of what we call a commissural tract, meaning it connects the two halves of the brain. So corpus callosum, what connects the left and the right half of the brain to each other, the corpus callosum. By the way, we, we could have, should have labeled before, the thalamus is the brain region here, but actually in the very middle of it, we have another ventricle or we have another fluid filled space. What's the other fluid? What's the name of the fluid filled space in the middle of the thalamus? Which ventricle is inside the thalamus? Yeah, the third ventricle is inside the thalamus. So if you see a question asking you about the ventricle that's here in the middle, that is the third ventricle. The fourth ventricle was down here. Does anyone happen to remember the name of the little tube? I did a bad job circling it, but the tube that connects the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle goes down from the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle. Now we're really, I'm really making you work tonight. <laughs> so the, the tube that connects the third and fourth ventricle to each other, that's called the cerebral aqueduct. So when I take fluid from the third ventricle down into the fourth ventricle, the tube that does that is the cerebral aqueduct. Gloria mentioned an important term for us to know as it relates to cerebrospinal fluid. Gloria mentioned something called the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus. What does the choroid plexus do? It is important for us to know it. Yeah, the choroid plexus is what I find inside each of my ventricles making that cerebrospinal fluid. Yeah, absolutely. The choroid plexus has those leaky blood vessels like we talked about in lecture. Yeah. So each of my ventricles, the third ventricle, the fourth ventricle, the two lateral ventricles that you can't really see on this picture, all of those have choroid plexus in them to uh, help us make cerebrospinal fluid. Yeah, so choroid plexus important as well. Third ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. From the fourth ventricle, we can go down into the spinal cord, that, that dot in the middle of the spinal cord called the central canal filled with cerebrospinal fluid. 
uh, or we can dump it out into the subarachnoid space where we can get rid of it. Only other thing that I'm going to take time for on this brain is to remind us about the lobes of the brain. So let's start here anterior. The anterior most lobe of the brain who lives up here. Yep, this one up here is your frontal lobe. This is the one you do decisions, uh, reasoning, your personality, frontal lobe up here. Then we go, yeah, it's all the motor stuff. Absolutely, Jesse. Uh, then we go here to our lobe that's the sensory part of the body. What's the name of this lobe here? Yeah, this lobe here is the parietal lobe where we find that parietal bone. And then down in the very back, my vision lobe back here is the occipital lobe. Absolutely. We cannot see the hearing lobe. That would be on the side of the brain, closest to your ears. Yeah, the hearing lobe is the temporal lobe. So if I could see through the thalamus, it'd be on the other side there. And then Gloria mentioned one that I don't have any models to show you. I do have one in the lab, but uh, we don't have any pictures of it in the packet for you. The thing called the insula, that's one lobe that's hidden underneath all of the other ones. Since it's hard for us to give you a picture of the insula, we want to make sure we know what the insula helps with. Does anyone happen to remember what the insula helps with? Yeah, the insula does taste. So if you know that the insula does taste, I'm not going to ask you to identify it because it's deep or it's underneath these other lobes of the brain that we just talked about. So the insula, that last lobe, that's deep underneath all of them. All right, I've got five minutes left. I know I had a couple of requests for the sarcomere model. So let's do the sarcomere model in, in the bit of time that we have left. Find that one right here. When we talk about the sarcomere model, Remember that we are talking about the teeny tiny parts inside skeletal muscle tissue. The fact that skeletal muscle tissue looks striated or the fact that it has stripes is because of the structure of a sarcomere. When we look at a sarcomere, I'm looking at the entire sarcomere. There's a few structures that that I need to know right off the bat that jump out at me. The first one are these zigzag things on the outside of a sarcomere. My zigzags. Yeah, the zigzag patterns are called Z-discs. Z-discs. A sarcomere begins and ends at Z-discs. So one sarcomere is this entire model here from one Z-disc to another Z-disc. In the very middle of the sarcomere, I have a line called the, yeah, exactly, called the M line, the middle line, if you will. So in the very middle of the sarcomere, the M line, on the very edges of the sarcomere, the Z discs. Around the M line, I have spaces in the sarcomere where I only see the thick filament of, of my sarcomere protein. So I only have my, my protein called myosin. What's the name of the part of a sarcomere where there's only myosin, only the thick filaments? Yeah, so it is H, we got our letter right. Uh, it is technically the H zone. We do have a lot of bands. I'm not gonna hold it against you if you call it a band because that's the blessing of a multiple choice test, right? <laughs> it's the H zone. Uh, so the H zone, remember that H is a thick letter. So the H zone is an area in the sarcomere where I only have thick filaments. Now imagine that I took this model and I chopped it in half and I zoomed in just on one side. That's what happens when you go from this picture to this picture. I've got just one half of my sarcomere. 
So here's some of the stuff we already labeled. We labeled that midpoint of the sarcomere called the M line. We also labeled the edge of the sarcomere called the Z disc. We've got a couple of brackets, again, representing areas in the sarcomere. So this is, again, that part of the sarcomere where I only have the thick filament. What was the area where I only had the thick filament? What was that called again? Yeah, that's called the H zone. H zone where I only have the thick filament. And then I also have these places toward the outside of the sarcomere where I only have the thin filaments. Yeah, this area over here toward the outside of the sarcomere is called the I band, the I band on the outer edge of the sarcomere. So here's my I band on the outside. Here's my H zone in the middle. Remember that the I band, I is a thin letter. I only have the thin filament here. H is a thick letter. I have the thick filament. I already mentioned this, this thick filament here shown in blue. What's the name of the blue protein or the thick protein? Yeah, the thick filament is made out of myosin. Most of the thin filament on this model is this red protein. What's the name of the main protein that makes up the thin filament? Yeah, that one's called actin, my thin protein that makes up most of it. But remember, there are two regulatory proteins that are attached to actin. One of them is the yellow spaghetti noodle that goes all the way across actin, blocking the myosin binding sites. My yellow protein is called tropomyosin, tropomyosin. But remember that tropomyosin is like a wet spaghetti noodle. It's not going to stay in place. It needs some help. It needs a push pin. My green push pin protein, exactly. My green push pin is troponin, troponin. And remember, troponin is the protein that calcium attaches to, causing it to change its shape. So it pops out of place. So tropomyosin pops out of place. And then myosin and actin can interact with each other. Uh, yeah, so Jesse asked about a, a place called the A band, or we mentioned it, I think, in, in lecture. Um, the A band would be places, A band goes the entire length of the myosin protein. So that's also going to include places called the zone of overlap. If I wanted to label the, the A band, it would be this area here. So it starts, I'll type that A band. I don't think we actually have to label it. Um, but yeah, it starts over here where the myosin protein ends and it goes all of the space with the myosin protein. So the A band is where they overlap with each other and then it includes all of myosin as well. Mainly focus on the I band on the left and the H zone on the right, more toward the middle. All right, my time is up. I will field any last minute questions that we have. Um, do we have any particular last minute questions? Yes, you all are welcome. I'm glad we were able to, to chat. I will mention too that tomorrow um, from, I believe, check my schedule, I think it's 11 to 12.30, I have open office hours. So if in your reviewing tonight, and tomorrow morning, there's some stuff that you can't find the right answer to, please feel free to reach out. Um, I will be here in the classroom, ready to answer any questions. That would also not be a bad time for you to consider taking the exam. 
in case something goes wrong and you want to reach me really fast. So tomorrow from 11 to 1230, I will be around. Um, otherwise, I'm always around via email. I will get back to you as, as soon as possible. Uh, but best of luck on, on the exam. And uh, we will dive into lecture stuff again on Wednesday. So lecture office hours beginning again on Wednesday, 930. So again, good luck on, on the exam. I'm going to turn off our recording and stick around for any last minute questions.